Hey, what's up, Unbroken Nation? Hope that you're doing well wherever you are in the world today. I'm very excited to be back with you with another episode with my friend Keith Yaki, who is the creator of MarriedGame.com. Keith, my friend, how are you today? What is happening in your world? Uh, I'm excited to be here, honored to be here, and excited to uh, to get in some of this juicy goodness that you and I both love. Yeah, same, man. You and I connected, I guess, almost a year ago, and I just, I felt your energy. I was like, this dude is about this life, about creating something good and powerful and and being a person of the word. And, you know, before we dive into things, I would love you to tell us a little bit about your backstory and how you got to where you are today. You bet, man. The I'm currently involved in helping guys uh, get their wives to want them again and to be attracted to them again and how that kicked off was five and a half, almost six years ago, my wife left me and uh, we were about ready to move into our dream house. And she said, Hey, I'm going to help you move in, but I am not staying. And it was the light bulb and the light switch that really flicked for me. And I was like, Oh my gosh, this lady who I love and adore, that was my ride or die till death do us part from here on out, who I had a beautiful daughter with that was only about two years old at the time. And now she's walking out of my life. And that was when I really woke up and realized I'm the problem, or at least I was 95% the problem. And um, I hired three coaches immediately to try and get her back. And I had to basically learn how to change me to become the partner, to become the husband, to become the dad that, um, that they deserved. Because I literally came to the realization that I, I, I pushed the greatest human being I've known out of my life and it was all on me. So that was where uh, I had to start the work of saying, do, do I want to be right in my brain or do I want to actually change and become a great dude so that the people that are closest to me, my wife and my daughter, rather than what she did say, which was basically my life would be better without you in it. She now says, I'm so glad that you're in my life. And, and things have changed so drastically over the last five and a half years that I felt touched on the shoulder by my creator and say, hey, you have a roadmap. You have a, a blueprint to help guys who are struggling with connecting and intimacy with their wives, which I believe the punchline is the wife is no longer attracted to them. You have the recipe on how to help these guys get that back for one reason, and that is to keep marriages together so kids don't have to start making and acting like adults that even adults can't act like. Because now we've got this mom and this dad who the kids are sitting down having dinner with and they're in love. Next thing you know, now they're enemies and the kids having to pick sides, they're going to, and they're having to make decisions that adults can't even make. They're having to make uh, decisions of who they're picked there. And I just feel like 80% of divorces don't need to happen. And if the dude steps up, he can save that and he can uh, live a life of harmony and joy, which is what most guys, re that's the reason why they got married. And I know that you, uh, we talk to a lot of women on here, but a lot of the women hear the story and oftentimes will forward it to their husband and say, Hey man, uh, I want to love you, but you're making it really difficult for me. So that has been the journey. It's why we started MarriedGame.com, and uh, we've been able to help out hundreds of guys. You know, re uh, spark the flame, and I just feel like I'm just this dude that figures something out, and I I call it the gospel of married game. I'm just sharing it with the world. Here's the good news: you couldn't get lower than me. You couldn't have been a bigger piece of shit than me. You couldn't have been. Uh, a worse of a father or a husband than me. And and now my friends would tell you like, who's got the best relationship around? I'm like, oh, Keith and Jesse, dude, that's, that's, that's relationship goal. So that's the story in a nutshell. I was at rock bottom and now I feel like I'm living at the peak and I, and there's a path and I just, Hey guys do this and uh, we can get there. Man, that's beautiful and and so powerful. And also congratulations because, you know, I, I look at what your mission is and when you understand the statistics that three and six children are being raised by single mothers, that tells you everything that you need to know about this country. Mm -hmm. and, and the thing that I am obsessed with and the reason why we created Think Unbroken, we do the podcast and the speaking and the books 
is to end generational trauma in our lifetime through education and information. And one of the things that is incredibly important, and I would contend that I would agree with you, is like creating relationships that where 80% of them don't have to end. I, I would agree. I, I think probably contextually, 20% definitely do. Um, yes. But I, I can't speak to that as someone who's never been married. Where, where I'd love to start this conversation and, and dive into is, is at that rock bottom. Because I, I think that so often we come through these experiences of life and and it's a can't see the forest for the trees kind of scenario until you're in this position where you're like, holy shit, my life is a disaster. What what really became the turning point? Like in that moment when you're sitting there and, and she's telling you, I'll help you move in, but I'm not living with you. I think that most people would crumble and succumb to that pressure and what was next and inevitably where your life is, is just not to pass for them. What happened for you that you were like, no, I'm going to do a three coaches. Dude, that's super intense. Like what happened in that moment and what transpired to lead you down that path? It was, it, it, it literally felt the, the best. One of my coaches expressed this to me and they said, cause I asked my wife, I'm like, I felt blindsided. And a lot of guys do feel blindsided when their wife's like, hey, by the way, I'm thinking about divorce or I'm thinking about leaving or I'm, I'm out of here. And my wife was like, dude, I've been trying to tell you for two years. And it literally, I just, I had, I, I didn't have ears to hear. I didn't have eyes to see. But as soon as she's like, I'm gone, it was, and I knew, I, I know her. So like her, like this wasn't like, hey, I'm thinking about this. It's like, no, I'm, I'm done. Like we are over the light switch went on and it was as the, my coach explained it to me as if you you're in a dark room and then the light finally goes on and you see everything in the room. That was what happened to me. So I couldn't deny the fact that dude, you caused this. And she gave me some pretty clear examples. Like, you know, you're, you're such a bad dad. I don't want to have another kid with you. Uh, you're such a bad dad. I don't even want to leave our daughter with you for an hour. You're such a horrible partner to me. I feel alone in this marriage. I don't even feel like you. I'm even a priority to you. She goes, you work on your business. You come home uh, and talk about your business and you fall asleep on the couch. And we deserve better than that. Your da daughter deserves. That's not what you promised us. You didn't, you're not doing what you said you were going to do. And who cares about this big, huge house and those really nice cars? That doesn't matter. So that was, I felt so empty. And if I'm being really honest, I felt really stupid. I felt like, how, 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 how did this happen? Like, how was I so blind to not be able to see this? So you're sitting there and you're realizing, well, who knows you better than your wife? Like, and, and at that point, dude, we had four and a half, almost five years under our belt. She knew everything. She'd seen some ups and downs financially. She'd seen me build a business or two that had done very well. She'd seen me make some mistakes. Like she knew the inner workings of who I was. And for her to say, my life would be better, our life would be better without you in it, that was where I was like, okay, dude, you, you can deny it, even though the evidence is really clear, and you can find somebody else. Finding another woman wouldn't have been hard. I'd proven I could do that before I met my wife. I'd been with hundreds of women before that. But it's like, yeah, but there was only one that you wanted to keep. And she doesn't even want to be around you. So do you want to go back to being with a bunch of women? Or do you want to actually deal with this so that you can change? And there was no promise that I was getting her back. I actually didn't think I was going to get her back. When I hired those coaches, you know, I was super desperate. What do I do? I didn't want my daughter to grow up in, in a broken home. I didn't want that to happen. But here I was realizing, well, I just did it. That was the big realization. I either change or this is going to happen again to me. I feel so often when people are at the precipice of change, they're, they're faced with an identity shift. And mm -hmm. that identity shift is one that in reality is unbelievably cumbersome because here you are faced with crossing this chasm of who you were to become who you want to be and trying to reconcile the truth of the person that you want to be is a person that you are not good enough yet to be. 
And most people quit on themselves the moment that they come to that realization and that truth. And you, you use that word change a couple of times going through that scenario just now. What did you want to become? Because, the, and the reason I'm asking you this is because I think so often people who have come from backgrounds where there's chaos or trauma or anything of that nature, we kind of solidify this idea of this is who I am, this is fine. One of the things I think is the most devastating term that a person could use is this is just who I am. Mm -hmm. And so as you're going through this process, you're facing the pain, the chaos, the struggle of becoming the Keith that you are today. What did that look like for you? How did you define that? How were you putting yourself in a position to honor who you wanted to be, but more importantly, keep your word to become that person? Well, she, uh, my wife gave me some very clear examples. She's like, we don't have fun anymore. When you and I met, we had a lot of fun. We would go on dates. We would go to concerts. We, uh, her and I have been to almost every major city in the country. Like, I mean, I mean, we're talking like all, you pick a major city. We've been there and, and had a good time there and not everyone, but like, dude, you start in Maine and we drove all the way down to, uh, to Maryland. And then we hit, we flew to a bunch of other cities all the way down to Florida. So we hit all the East coast. We've been all everywhere all these really cool spots having a good time and she's like we we don't do any of that anymore and we don't you don't even take me on dates she's like you i want to go to a con you won't even take me to a concert so she's like she lost her identity in me and she didn't she's like i'm the fun girl like who i used to be and so she gave me some really good examples of how um i wouldn't even just ask her about who she was and when she left, I realized, oh, my God, this lady was absolutely amazing. I had had a lot of context to determine whether she was a great gal or not because I'd been with so many other ones. And I was like, dude, all she needed was – all she wanted, like any human, was for somebody to pay attention for a little bit and actually listen with intent to hear. That was a very, very clear one. I She gave me some great examples of what a what a horrible parent I was. And I was like – Dude, that's not even fair to this little girl that I brought into the world. How, how, I couldn't get up and change any diapers. I couldn't be there for my lady and be like, hey, you sleep in tonight. I'll, I'll bottle feed her. Let me take like very clear examples that when you hear it, you're like, that's how I felt so stupid because it's like it was so obvious. And who I wanted to be was the guy that his wife would be like, he's the greatest dad. You know what? He, he watches the daughter so I can go out with the girls, you know, every so often so I can feel like a woman again rather than just always being stuck in mom mode. So it was like very crystal clear examples where I was like, what was I so busy doing that I couldn't have done any of those things? So it was a rare, very stark contrast. And I'm like, well, shit, wouldn't I want my best friend to think I'm the best human in the world? OK, well, clearly she doesn't. And she gave me really great examples and I realized that change is not all the way from black to all the way to white. It's very small decisions in the moment that make the change. It's not, dude, you can't have, you can't eat chocolate. It's don't eat three Snickers bars. Have like a half of one. It's, it's, it's those little things. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That was yeah. the biggest realization is, oh, my God, this actually isn't going to be as hard as I thought, because I think that's the big thing is I got to change. And it's like, oh, it's this huge thing as opposed to, no, it's very small decisions in, in, in strategic spots. So it became very incremental for you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's practical too, right? Because I, you know, I look at my own journey, finding myself at 25, 26 years old, I'm 350 pounds, smoking two packs a day, drinking myself to sleep. And you're like, but wait a second, I can't not be that tomorrow, but I can be a little bit less of that tomorrow and yeah. a little bit less, a little bit less, a little bit less. And then on this long enough timeline, right. And it'll be different for everyone. You, you start to shape and, and meld into this idea of the person that you thought you could be a as you were going through this process, like, how are you reconciling these actions that had led you to this place to be able to step into what was next? Well, I I'm going to give you a quick little example. So 
uh, I was coming in, into the house and it was about, you know, all my friends call me grandpa Yaki cause I go to bed around eight, eight thirty, <laughs> and I don't really stay out late much anymore. And my friend of mine's like, Hey, you want to come over? I haven't, I hadn't caught up with in a while. Uh, it was Jeremy, you know, Jeremy Finlay. And yeah. he sang with Garrett on stage that day. And he's like, Hey, I got this new pool table. You want to come over and shoot pool and smoke cigars? I'm like, dude, I'd love to. So I grab my cigars, I head over to his house and I get back around like 10, which is late for me. And I took my shoes off and rather than bend down and put them on the, and just pick them up and put them on the rack, my brain immediately goes, Jesse, Jesse will understand you got home late. So just leave them in the middle of the the garage where she might trip on them. And it was like, no, I'm going to take one second, pick them up and put them in the rack. I then walked down the hallway into where I was going to put the cigars, but in my, in my haste, I kind of grabbed it. I left the cigar drawer kind of all muddled up and shit everywhere. Right. And I go, that's okay. It's late. I can clean it tomorrow. And then I'm like, well, let's see how long it would take to actually leave that drawer cleaner than when you left it. And I started counting out loud one, 1,000, two, 1,000, three, 1,000. It took me 13 seconds to leave that drawer cleaner than when I left it. And that's what I mean by that small change. So I started to started to make the smallest adjustments and realize, dude, the difference between being a slob and being clean is between one and 13 seconds. That's that. I hope that lands very practically for the audience because it's like, that's all it is, is it's nope. I'm going to put them back. Nope. I'm going to make everything. I'm, I'm, I'm going to, uh, one of the things that Jesse used to bust my balls all the time is like, how do I always know where you've been in the kitchen? <laughs> because I've left a trail, <laughs> whether it's crumbs, a little bit of protein powder, wh- whatever it is. She's like, I-, I know where you've been. She goes, you're like a child. <laughs> and I was like, dude, it takes me one swipe of the hand to get clean the counter off, put it in the trash. That's less than a second. And I started realizing that change is not, this big long road, but it's a very short, it's a half a second. It's a second that just says, no, my standard is you will never know where I'm at because uh, everything that I touch is cleaner than when I found it. So that, that was the biggest shift for me. And like, oh my God, it's so easy to say, Hey, we're going on a date night this week. Let's figure out a babysitter. Let's figure out somewhere to go. And I could spend five minutes organizing. Then it's on the books. Then it's just easy. Okay. I'm going on a date night. So that, that was the biggest shift for me throughout this entire journey was, oh my God, I, I'm thinking everything is this massive Herculean effort. It's not. It's very, very small. Did that answer yeah. the question or did I go off, pay, off track? No, and, and I, I, I think that's a great answer and you're so right. Like I look at my apartment sometimes and I'm like, I love how clean it is. I love how clean it is because I have made myself accountable to creating that lifestyle Growing up for me, our house was always disheveled, total chaos, like unbelievably disgusting because of, you know, having a drug addict, alcoholic parents. And as an adult, I've I've looked at it, I go, okay, this is mine. I own this, my responsibility. This means that I get to have control over it. And I I think what I hear in this is you taking ownership in this moment, whereas in the past you hadn't. And, and when it comes to those past experiences, Keith, I'll, I'll circle a little bit back to that question. Like, was there forgiveness for yourself? Like what, what actually happened for you emotionally as you've stepped into this journey? Cause I look at this as a healing journey, man. Yeah. This isn't just Keith did some shit and he put some stuff away and his wife wanted him back. Yeah, no, this was, um, all right. Well, and, and a, a little piece of context I had been divorced five years, six years before this to my previous wife, and I had three kids with her. So this was starting to become a pattern. I'm like, oh, here's number two. And you're the problem again. Again, you don't fix this. You're going to, it's going to be number three and number four and number whatever. And so I had to, it's, um, this is not a term that people really, really like, but it's the only one that I know how to use. And I had to kind of look at myself in the near naked, in the in the mirror naked, and go, "This is reality. Are 
you can't believe fantasy anymore. Nobody's buying into your bullshit. Are you willing to stop buying your own bullshit and deal with the truth? And that was the reality. And that was the reality of saying, I'm the problem. Okay. But what I realized is when you're the problem, you're also the solution. And so it gave me hope, honestly. It, it, the, the hope was, oh my God, I don't know if I can change enough, fast enough for me to get Jesse back. But I know, given enough time, I can become this person that Jesse would never leave. And I said these words, and this I think will tie this point home. I told Jesse, I honor you. I respect the hell out of you for leaving. Because it wasn't like she had this source of income, even though leaving me, she, she would have something. Um, I said, it is such a bummer that some other woman is going to cash in on all your hard work. And I apologize for that. Because that's what I realized what was happening is, oh my God, I can change. I can do this. I, I can be a good husband. I can be a good father. I can be a good dude. It's going to take me some time to work on some of these selfish things that uh, came about. But it was having the audacity, maybe would be the word, to actually call my bullshit what it really was. And that is, this is some bullshit. So for me, I've always been a good talker. And I talked myself into lies. Mm. And I had to call myself on it and be real with myself. I would have never done it, though, had she not done it. Yeah, I, I think, unfortunately, sometimes we do need that outside stimulus to wake us up. Um, yeah. I, I certainly have been there myself. Speaking of talking yourself into your own bullshit, you know, we we all play that game with ourselves. I, I don't think anyone's innocent of this. I, I've never met a single person who's ever got away with anything because at the end of the day, it always is going to sit with you. Your truth is going to be there. And, and what I'm wondering is as you started to go through that process of like sitting in your own bullshit, like you're stewing in it, right? You're percolating and you're, you're having this moment. Well, I won't put words in your mouth, but what I will say is I've had those moments where I'm looking at my life and I'm like, holy fuck, dude, this is a disaster. And, and there are, are people who just will further destroy themselves and fall deeper into the cesspool of that moment. What what advice do you have for people who are listening right now and they're like, I need to take this hard look at my life. Something is amiss. Something is askew. I know it. I rationalize it. Hell, I might even like applaud myself for being in it at times because you're like, wow. And how do they move through that? Like, what do you actually do to start to get to this place where you're like, yeah, here's my fucking bullshit. Now do something. I, well, I would say my first step was grieving. I had to grieve the loss. Uh, bro, I was in the gym like six hours a day for like three weeks. And it wasn't, I was lifting weights the whole time. I was swimming laps. I was in the sauna. I was on the bench next to the sauna crying my eyes out. I was doing chest day three times on a Monday. It, I mean, and I, I felt so much regret that I had really messed up my life. And I, I, there was a lot of pain. So it's not like I just went from, oh, she left. I got to change shoes in the thing. Like it, it was, a. there's so much deep pain that wrought through my heart that I would cry. I had like three or four friends. I just would call and say, Hey man, can I just, can you, can you talk me through this again and let me know that I'm not the biggest piece of shit in the world, even though I felt like it like that. I had my like Pete Vargas and Dan Martell. And a couple of these are my buddies that they would just sit there and listen to me. And, and, and that was, that was really the first step was I admit it. I'm so ashamed by it. I'm an idiot. I can't believe I did this. And okay, now what? Okay, well, if I'm the problem, I'm the solution. And then said, okay, well, what does, here's the other thing that I didn't really like. I didn't like being held accountable for what I said I was going to do. So I'd always slip out of things and I always had a good reason for it. And that's when I was like, okay, if you're going to say you're going to do something, you're actually going to have to do it because you're not going to get what you want unless you do. And that was that that became the smallest little step. If I say I'm going to go to the gym, I don't have to be there a long time. I just have to get to the gym because I said I was going to do it. If I said I was going to call my daughter, who is now in a different state, 
I've got, it doesn't matter how long it, it, it's just a minute or two minutes. It's okay. I just have to call her because I said I was going to do it. That's where all the actual, that's where kind of all that started to come about where I was like, wow, you're just a dude that can talk and you bought your own bullshit and you don't actually do what you say you're going to do. Because if I did say what I was, did, what I was going to say I was going to do, then my wife would have stayed. And it's actually what I teach guys now, Michael, is uh, most women aren't worried about their men cheating, but their women don't trust their men that they're actually going to do what they say they're going to do. It's where I came up with the phrase, when the trust goes up, the lust goes up. Because now my wife goes, whatever Keith says he's going to do, you can, you can put money on it. It's going to happen. He's human. He makes mistakes but he never will dodge out of it. And so that's where a lot of guys and gals in the relationship is the, the wife is just like, he said he was going to do the dishes. And then he's like, Oh yeah, I'm gonna leave him for tomorrow. But why? That's not what you said you were going to do. I felt like I went off track on that one, Michael. I apologize, but I, I got, I got to the vein. No, you're good, man. There, there's no off track in life. The time is now my friend. Um, okay. You know, I, I'm, as you're going through this, I'm thinking, to myself, like just reconciling some of these memories of, of my own experiences in the beginning of shifts. And, and what I'm meaning by this is that place in which you are like, this is who I am now. And you're battling that old version of you. When, when I wrote my first book, I, I put a, a line in there. I said, I took the old Michael out behind the woodshed and I killed him. And, and that was a necessity in my life because what I had to do was let go of that. But there was always still that like little bit of a twinge of like imposter syndrome, mm. right? That little bit of a twinge of like, is this really me? Am, am I lying to myself about doing good things? Which is like mm. such a crazy juxtaposition. Mm. So as you're in this shift, man, you're starting this process. And I, I think whether you're talking about just little things like accountability and doing what you say or big giant things, I feel like there's always this place in which you're at war with yourself mm. initially. Did, did this hold true for you? Yeah. Um, you know, we aren't what we say we are. We are what we do, right? Like we are what we repeatedly do because that's how you show up in the world. And we, I can only judge you by your actions, right? Your words will suffice until your actions are different from that. And the phrase that I always had to keep going on my head is you are what you do. You are what you do. You are what you do. So even if I didn't feel like it, I'm going to go do it. And then usually in the doing of it, you start to realize, oh, wait, I'm doing it. And it kind of was a shock for me. And I think it's a shock for anybody who's doing new things. You're kind of like, Wow, I'm actually I'm actually doing it. And it it's only by doing the action and not even having to do it very pretty or very eloquently or very graciously. You're just a lot of times when you're doing new stuff, it's very, very clunky. But you're like, but I'm doing it. And we have a phrase, my buddy Garrett and I, we surf every day, and we have a phrase we call it surfers surf. Doesn't mean you're good, it just means you surf. So waves are small, they're big, they're choppy, they're hollow, they're whatever. Surfers surf. And if you surf, you're a surfer. It doesn't mean you're a good one, but you surf. And that is a phrase that has always just, hey, uh, uh, a marketer markets, a sales guy sells, uh, uh, a speaker speaks. Like broken down into that simplest thing, I go, oh, I might not be good at it yet but I'm doing it. I might not be good at date nights back in the beginning. I'm like, okay, we're implementing the one. She did come back. I'm like, all right, we're going out once a week so we can stay connected. And so that I, we know that our intimacy will be good because I'm going to give you all of the greatest asset I have, which is my energy. Uh, I used to believe that time was my greatest energy. Now I believe it's uh, time is my greatest asset. Now I believe it's energy because I've had all the time in the world, but no energy. You're just a vegetable. It doesn't mean anything. I think time is close. And so I'm like, oh, well, what is when people say they want your attention, what are they saying? They want your focused energy right on right on them. And so that's where I started going, OK, where I need to start focusing on what I what I want, what I'm going to become. And then just go just go just go do that without all the complication. Yeah, I, I love that. And I, I'm sitting here thinking to myself, like writers, write, Right. That, that's yeah. what came to mind me. I'm, I'm, I'm always a writer first. Podcasters, podcast, you know, runners run, whatever that might be. I love the simplicity of it. And I don't know anyone 
ever in history who has been proficient at something the first time they did it. Like, it's just, it's implausible. It's not a thing. And I, I believe that we hold ourselves to such a huge court about being great all the time. And it's like, dude, like, I'm not, I don't know anyone who is like this entire journey is this really consummate back and forth of like, fall down, get up, fall down, get up, fall down, get up, and just continue to go forward. You know, yeah. prior to, to us hopping on here, you and I were talking about accountability and keeping your word. And you said something I thought was really, really beautiful that I'd love for you to go into uh, about your journey over the last six months. And, and most importantly, this concept of what keeping your word has meant to you. Yeah, it's it, everybody wants to feel powerful. They want to have the the power to do something or they want to um they want to become something more, but they don't feel like they have the power to do it. And in for the last, you know, three years, uh, either privately teaching guys for two of those years. And then this last year being really heavily out in the marketplace, uh, doing my work with guys, I, I found out that power and attraction are very, very similar things. And here's what I discovered is that power and attraction is like a balloon filled with air. It doesn't you don't pop it and it goes away. It can, like, you know, if you cheat, you know, you can break trust and those types of things. But normally for everybody, it's a very small, very small pinhole that you can't, it's imperceptible to the human eye, whether you're growing or whether you're regressing in a 24 hour period of time. You can't, you can't see it. Like if you go, Hey, I'm going to go on a diet the very next day, or, or if you look in the mirror, you probably won't see anything the next day. There might be a move on the scale, but if there's no metric or no number to see anything, it's to the human eye, everything looks the same over a 24 hour period of time for the most part. And so I realized, holy shit, actually having power, having power means you're not looking for any external thing to validate you, to help you, to approve of you, to give you anything, to, to assist you. No, because you have your own personal power. You are, you make it rain for you. And I realized, oh my gosh, the only thing that made me believe in me more than anything else was this very one simple thing. And it's the only thing that I think that gives anybody power and can help anybody actually do anything. And that is keeping your word to yourself. Do what you say you're going to do. When you say you're going to do it, zero compromise, zero modifications, zero bullshit. That started for me October 4th of this last year, about, I guess we're talking six or seven months ago now. And that one simple thing is the only thing. And so I would be like, all right, I'm going to do this today. These are the three things that are important to me. I've got to do these three things. If I don't do anything else, I'm going to accomplish these three things. I noticed I felt proud of myself. I felt powerful that I did that. And then I could start stacking on top of, okay, not only am I going to do those three things, I'm going to do these four things. I'm going to do these five things to where I get to think like I'm doing this every single day, whether it's raining, shining, whatever. And so I did 75 hard, which was the, the that was the, the process that I used. That was the tool that helped me to realize keeping my word to myself was the only thing that would give me the respect in myself and my respect for myself. And it hit really hard. I was in Vegas. A lot of people don't understand that Las Vegas gets really, really cold. It's the desert. And when I lived out there, sometimes it would snow. I mean, it's it's windy. It can be cold. And I was there doing comedy um, at the Wise Guys. Have you ever done? Uh, you ever you've heard of Wise Guys in uh, Salt Lake, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, they, they just opened a place uh, about six months ago in Las Vegas. They have a, a showroom now in Las Vegas. And I went there to do a show. I was on 75 hard, which has a bunch of things you can and cannot do. And I was about maybe four weeks into this process of keeping my word to myself every single day for like four weeks. And I go downstairs to work out after the show or the, the day after the show. And like, you got to wear a mask. I'm like, well, I'm not doing that. They're like, well, then you can't work out here. I'm like, okay, no problem. But I had like just a sweater, my short shorts and like my Nike tennis shoes. So, well, I better head outside. It's the only place I can work out. And it was like, I want to say like 37 degrees or 38 degrees out. And I start running in front of the Bellagio Hotel. And there's these dudes, there's these bums out there. And they're like, why, boy, you are crazy. Do you know how cold it is out here? 
And I looked at him, I go, not in here. And I kept running. I, that wasn't my planned response. It just came out of me. And I was like, oh, shit. Oh, shit. You kept your word to yourself. Hmm. That's beautiful, man. And and I, I think so important, it's, there's always an excuse. There's always a reason why you can't. There's always a space to negotiate. There's always the other thing that will stop you from having the life that you want to have. And I, I fear that so many people, they, they hear conversations like this and they go, yeah, but that's you, Keith, or that's you, Michael, or that's you, whomever I'm listening to, but that's not me. I, I can never do that. I'll, I'll never be able to do that. And, and I sit and I go, yeah, you can, but you've got to be willing to do it. For, for those who hear you and they're like, yeah, that's great, but it'll never work for me. I'm never going to be able to have accountability. I'll never have a healthy relationship. I'll never have a great body. I'll never feel good about myself. Like, what do those people do, Keith? Start small. Everything is, and I say start small. Everything actually is small. Once you realize it, you're like, these are just small actions. But um, say, you know what? For the next five days, I'm not going to drink soda. And watch what happens on day five when you keep your word to yourself. Or, hey, for the next seven days, I'm going to get up and take a 10-minute walk. One of the things I started after October 4th was I used to never run. And so when I'm like, you know, my buddy my buddy made fun of me. He goes, hey, Keith, if, if shit ever happens here, I'm going to have to throw you on my back because you can't run very well. You might be able to lift more than us, but you can't run very well. And, and it was joking because, like, you know, guy friends, we just talk shit to each other like we do. But it kind of started to hit. I'm like, dude, I'm a liability. I can't even run. So what I did was I said, okay, well, I'm not good at running. How am I going to do it? So I just started literally running the shortest hills down, just downhill. Like I'm just going to run downhill. And I have a, a hill out in my backyard, you know, in my back out here. And I'm like, I'm just going to run from here. It's maybe, about, maybe a football field long. And it had a little bit of a slope down. I'm like, I'm just going to run that today. And then the next day, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to run it once and then walk it up, walk up the next one, and then run it down, run twice. I'm going to do it twice. See, see if I can do it twice. It's the smallest thing. Even David Goggins, who a lot of people have heard of, when he said he was so heavy, he said he could, he could only like run a quarter mile, then he'd have to stop. Like I think what happens is that people forget that rip people used to be, most rip people used to be fat. Most people who didn't run or most people who are good at running used to not run. There's this weird thing in human beings that think that when they see somebody who's good at something, they for some reason believe they started out good at it. But 99.9% .9 of everybody who started anything were, was horrible at it. You're, you're a great podcast host, but I would venture to say your first episode looked nothing like this one. <laughs> and yeah, people go, oh my gosh, dude, you're lucky. You've got this podcast that gets all these downloads and all this. And you're like, oh, dude, dude you should have I'll, seen episode one. I'll show you the stats. Nobody listened to episode one. Nobody for years. Nobody listened to episode 30 or 60 or 85 or 150 or 200 or 250. You know, and it's like, how bad do you want it? You know, and I, I think that there's something innate about the experience of choosing yourself that for me, at least it's been, it's not even only about the podcast, but it's like what you said, Keith, it's, I decided to keep my word to myself. We did two things this year. When I sat down with the team at the beginning of the year, I said, one, we're releasing a show every day. It's, it's basically May. We have not missed a day Two. We will have the number one show in the mental health and personal development space in the world. And we were number eight in Ireland last week and number 40 in the US, number 38 in Canada. And, and to me, I look at this and I go, I don't negotiate with my dreams. I don't yeah. negotiate with my goals. And, but I will say this, there was a very, very, very long period of time in my life where all I did was quit. Yes, me too. All I did was quit. Yeah, me too, man. What does it so, feel like for you to not be that anymore? I, I, I wish, 
I wish I could implant this feeling in someone's heart for a minute. If they could feel it for a minute, they would never go back. They would, ne- they would go, oh my God, it's the gr- accomplishing something that you thought was difficult and you actually did it. I'll give you a very real world example. I was doing these five minute cold water plunges for 30 days and my daughter would watch me do it because it was out in my pool. My pool during the winter was cold, about 52, 53 degrees. And an ice bath is about 50 to 60 degrees. So it was on the lower end and it was, it would like, your skin would start to tingle. And uh, we have a mantra and we've had it for a long time, but I, I didn't really understand it up until in this last six months where we said, yakis do hard things. And my daughter would watch me do five minutes. And when I finished my 30 days of five minutes, she goes, Dada, it's not even hard for you anymore. What are you going to do next? And I said, well, maybe I should just hang out in the deep end and tread water for five minutes. And she watched me. She goes, okay, let's do it. So I, I'm treading water for five minutes. She goes, that wasn't that hard for you. I said, well, what do you want me to do? She goes, why don't you double it and do, she's seven, by the way. She goes, why don't you do 10 minutes? I said, deal. I will tread for 10 minutes in the deep end of this pool for the next 30 days. It was just something between her and I for the next 30 days. Well, three days into it, I'm like, well, I got to do a 45 minute workout out here. I wonder if I could tread water for 45 minutes. I was so scared. No lie. I told my wife, Hey, will you come check on me? I will not call your name unless I'm about ready to drown. She goes, dude, the deep end of our pool is only six foot and you're six feet. You're not going to drown, bro. I go, but I don't know if I seize up, if it's cold, whatever you, I tried to water for 45 minutes in that cold. I had to work my way up to it. I finally did it. You couldn't convince me that I hadn't won the Super Bowl. You couldn't convince me that I hadn't won game seven of the World Series down by three bases loaded, two outs, two pitches at the bottom of the line, and I knock it over the left field fence. The feeling of accomplishment and of, uh, of, oh my God, I did this, was greater than anything I've ever felt in my entire life. That is the feeling I wish I could implant in somebody because then they would go, oh my God, it's, it's not even that, it's not even that I can say I treaded water for 45 minutes. It's that feeling of not being lazy, of not being so intimidated that I wouldn't try it. That was the craziest feeling of my, my entire life. Man, that's, that's so what I wish people could experience. So beautiful. I, I wish the same thing, dude. I mean, I've had these moments in my life where I just, I crossed that threshold into doing the thing I said I was going to do. And I just felt so amazing. And, yeah. and you're right. And, the more that you do that, the more you have to level up. That's kind of the tricky game of it, but that's what makes life so interesting and enthralling. Keith, my friend, this has been an amazing conversation. Before I ask you my last question, can you tell everyone where they can find you? Um, you can find me at Keith Yaki on Instagram. Um, or if they're interested, like if there's any guys listening, like, Hey man, my wife isn't initiating or enthusiastically participating, or she's more into the spreadsheets than she is the bed sheets. And I want to learn how to get my wife to want to love me more. Or if there's ladies listening to this and like, man, I want my husband to really step up and be a good parent and a partner and, and, and really have fun in our marriage again. I would send them to uh, go to marriedgame.com. And I have a video there for you that you'll want to watch that will explain the attraction between. I've learned a lot since my wife left me and and I got her back. And now we've taught hundreds of guys how to fix this. I, I think they'll find it to be very intriguing. Brilliant. And of course, we'll put the links in the show notes. Keith, my last question for you, my friend. What does it mean to you to be unbroken? I think... To be unbroken is to say, I am going to take what it, who it is that I am right now, and I'm going to give my best. And I think that the unbroken spirit of man says, I'm going to do my best. And if you can really say, I've done my best, you, you don't feel broken. Simple. Brilliantly said, my friend. Thank you so much for being here. Unbroken Nation, thank you so much for listening. Please like, subscribe, comment, share, tell a friend. And until next time, my friends, 
be unbroken. I'll see you.